This meeting will be in English. My name is Adam Mazur and I'm uh, the host of this uh, uh, panel discussion. We are waiting still for one more person, which is uh, uh, Karol Radziszewski, our uh, superstar who just won the main prize of the Warsaw Gallery Weekend. But he will have his uh, uh, kind of entree in a moment. Uh, but two other uh, guests are here with us. Um, and this is like a super curator from Vienna that now moved to uh, Germany, from what I know, uh, Fanny Hauser. And um, uh, Fanny is curating the video program for Warsaw Gallery Weekend, so she will tell us about this in a moment. And uh, we have um, uh, um, Adam Nowakowski, who's a meta guy. This is the uh, Facebook um, company, so to speak. And um, he's not really into the arts or visual arts or contemporary art, but um, uh, will tell us uh, uh, briefly about what meta is and how it can be applied or used also to, uh, you know, or somehow connected to what is happening in, uh, in the art today or how can it be used maybe by, by us or by artists. So um, uh, I asked Adam to prepare some sort of an uh, introduction. So waiting for Karol Radziszewski, I think we'll start with this, uh, if it's okay uh, for us. Uh, there is one more thing. I'm uh, supposed to say thank you to all the people who were uh, helping us, and especially uh, Joanna. Uh, and this, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, Bożena uh, also. And these uh, institutions are uh, the city, miasto, municipality, right? Uh, ministry of Culture, uh, you know, not so far away from here, and Meta, Meta of course, MMA, and A Academy uh, of Fine Arts, um, where we are now, and um, they are also like providing all these things like uh, projector and uh, the space. So thank you for this. So uh, let's start with the Meta and wait for Carol. Uh, he will come in a moment, but Adam. Okay, uh, hello everyone, I'm Jim Nobody. Um, do, is this really necessary? Um, because I, 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 I kind of feel I have to make a, a conscious effort not to scream through the mic. Um, we would care perfectly without it, but I'm possibly the, um, this is somehow connected to the camera. Uh, so yes, as um, Adam mentioned, I'm an advertising professional and frankly everything I'm going to tell you about will somehow relate to, to basically commercial communication that can be applied, of course, to the art world. Of course, there is a significant overlap between advertising and art in the sense that both rely on craft, on storytelling, uh, on, well, a variety of creative and imaginative tools, solutions, and whatnot. Now, I'll I was asked to talk about what Meta, or Facebook, and Instagram, and all these platforms and technologies have to offer um, to the art world in the context of video as a form of expression. And I guess I need to start from the end, or actually from, from the future. That frankly does not exist at this point, but is the topic or the subject of immense hype. And there's a lot of talk about this metaverse, um, what is it? We don't know yet, really. Um, but in the shortest of definitions, it's supposed to be a three-dimensional internet. That's probably the simplest of thing, uh, descriptions I can offer you. It's supposed to be, immer it's, it's, an, it's an internet we will be able to step into. So, Instead of engaging with content that is two-dimensional, it will be three-dimensional. It will be a space. 
as possibly um, you see here. Frankly, this, this is just a, an artistic visualization as the metaverse, as you see here, frankly, it doesn't look this well. Um, and possibly you don't even believe, you don't think that this looks well <laughs> because it looks like a, a Pixar uh, film or something that's basically a, an animation. Well, the, the objective for all the engineers that are working on this solution, on this technology, is to actually make it photorealistic. And in doing so, the ambition is to create a virtual world with a virtual economy that will allow to reduce distance completely. Now, of course, telecommunication has been reducing distance for a very long time, since the days of the telegraph, and then the telephone, and the radio, and, and recently Zoom. We've all been kind of reducing distance and being capable of, of speaking with people that are very far, far away. Now, the metaverse is an amazing technology because when you engage with other people, you actually have a sense of their presence. So even though, at this point, this technology allows avatars to, to, in, to, to engage and communicate, which actually don't even have legs at this point because this technology is in its infancy and apparently animating legs is extremely complicated and requires immense amounts of, um, of computing power. But the vision is to create this technology that will allow people to socialize, to work, to, to learn, and to, to immerse in all these different types of, of content that will allow them to, to basically, well, gain better understanding of the real world. Now, when I speak about the metaverse to audiences, I, I'm, I often get this um, voice from, uh, from, from the audience saying, but the real world is fine. We don't want you and your company to move us into the virtual world and, you know, because we can, we can go to galleries, go to theaters, go to school, go to work, meet with our friends by the table, have some wine, right? We don't need that. Well, and frankly, that's absolutely true. Um, this is supposed to be an option that is used whenever it is convenient, whenever it's practical, right? We've been in lockdown and we know that it's kind of good to actually be able to do things remotely. And this basically is just the next step of doing so. And sometimes actually, oh, where did that go? It's kind of good to have the chance to, 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 to practice things in the virtual world without maybe doing a mistake and killing a patient or something. Um, yeah. Now, also, uh, sometime possibly in the future, but not now, you know, these, uh, whoops, where is this going, pardon me. Right, um, th this technology will allow a huge groups of people to, for instance, participate in virtual events like concerts and uh, possibly the um, Warsaw Gallery weekend also be virtualized for whatever reason. Um, right now though, this technology is in its infancy. Uh, so if you'd want to go to a virtual event, actually just 16 people can fit into the virtual space, not more. So we couldn't, do, we couldn't be in the virtual world at this point, unfortunately. But, um, well, maybe. At this point, it's kind of clunky. Uh, it's, uh, you know, if, if, um, if this technology was 
our mobile phones, then uh, it's definitely not an iPhone. It's, a, it's one of the early Nokias. Okay? So definitely a, a, a long way to go. And this is basically something that um, has been done by a quick service restaurant. Because, well, that's what the McDonald's of the world do when they kind of engage with a new technology. Well, of course, we want to do a virtual restaurant and shoot hamburgers through hoops and nonsense like that. Um, possibly that's why we need artists to start experimenting with this technology, for possibly to actually um, put it to more profound uses. Um, definitely, uh, I want you to, uh, to feel invited. Now, at this point, virtual reality is used by high culture institutions uh, to produce virtual reality experiences. Um, I'm not sure where this comes from, um, but I am aware that actually the Welsh Opera House has been um, staging virtual reality operas. Um, of course, the first one to go was ma the Magic Flute. And then, uh, who knows what else. Um, yes, there are also some musical experiences available already, uh, as, for instance, all kinds of limbo. You might actually go and try it, uh, because it's also accessible simply by um, by phone. That actually means that you'd be participating in a musical and looking at it through a keyhole, this keyhole, but um, possibly it's uh, something that you might want to try just to see how things stand at this point. Now, the metaverse is not just virtual reality, it's also about augmented reality, which I think might actually be, be the more important, useful, and interesting mm, application of this technology because it allows um, to create these virtual objects that exist, well, kind of side by side with reality. And so what you get is a, a mixed reality experience. So in the arts, for instance, this might mean that it would not be uh, this athlete developed by Adidas, uh, but possibly it would allow us to engage with an actor on a stage or not on a stage, somewhere in the street. Uh, and in this way, some sort of artistic experience would be um, delivered. Um, otherwise, it's also quite useful for um, industrial design for instance, because you can prototype certain um, objects and see how they fit into the, um, into the uh, real space in which possibly uh, an artifact or a physical object will be placed. At some point in the future, um, these glasses might be mainstream. Uh, you all remember um, the Google Glass experiment, and even though Google in the meantime has decided to uh, drop that project, uh, well, augmented reality glasses are not entirely uh, dead as a concept. They still are uh, being researched by engineering departments, uh, definitely in, in Meta, at Meta, but also in Google, in Microsoft, and a variety of other companies that um, deal with uh, this sort of technology. And I think that this um, might lead also to quite interesting um, consequences, possibly for graffiti artists um, who might want to actually uh, use this technology to add, augment a digital, add a digital layer to their art and make it, um, well, even, uh, even more interesting uh, for whatever reason. Now, all these, all these things kind of are connected 
somehow uh, also to the concept of, of Web3 and, of course, the infamous NFTs that um, I think that at this point um, they've been abused and the whole concept has uh, suddenly been tainted. But uh, ultimately what, what these three things are about is creating a creator economy and an internet in which actually it's, it's, it makes sense to be a creator because Web3 is about basically moving the power from the publishers, from the platforms like my own to, oh, sorry about this, thought, I, I thought this was be, will be in Polish, then forgot to read the, uh, right? So, yeah, but most of us do understand this, right? So the, the first web was about publishers and people just reading what the publishers wrote in the internet. Now web 2.0 is about interactivity and the fact that the users are creating the content but the platforms are monetizing the content, my employer. And then Web3 is about the users creating the content and controlling the content and making money off the content, right? So that's, that's where hopefully all this will be going with non-fungible tokens uh, and the blockchain as, as a result. Now, in, uh, Instagram, at this point, I don't think that this is a very profound image. We need to go. Okay, <laughs> let's move. Um, anyway, so... We're experimenting with this, although um, who knows what, what, um, what it means uh, in, in, the, um, in the long term. We will find out. Now, um, what is interesting about the internet right now and Instagram and Facebook, what I think is, is very relevant for creators is the fact that this platform is beginning to rely on algorithmic recommendations. So that means that people using the platform will be engaging more and more with content that is recommended to them based on their interests and not with content that is simply created by their friends. And so well, there'll be less lunches on the platform and more things that people are interested in coming from people that are not necessarily their friends, their family, or even the Kardashians. As far as video is concerned, I think that the Reels product is possibly um, kind of the, mo the most important one. Uh, although, obviously, you know, this is just a short form video format um, that is useful because, again, it's based on recommendation, so everybody gets a feed that is personalized to their interest. So if someone's interested in art, his Reels feed will be full of art. Okay? Um, yeah, I, I don't think I need to kind of explain to you about uh, the, the, the kind of the details of all the f placements or formats or spaces where creative can be published, um, and neither do we have the time to do so. So I'll shut up now and let Adam uh, begin our, our talk. Okay, thank you. Here you go. Thank you for this introduction. Um, this is super exciting because um, I realized that I met just uh, now like the first person from Meta in my life, so this is like for real. And, um, and now um, uh, we know a bit more about the future of Instagram and, uh, and Facebook. Uh, I guess um, uh, Warsaw Gallery Weekend is very keen on those, like two uh, communications channels. So uh, it's also, it, it's, it's not maybe that virtual, but um, they are using it a lot. Uh, however, like to add to what you said, um, uh, this uh, artwork is kind of using um, uh, meta tools in a, in a very primitive way, I would say, as for now, because it looks like they are selling, uh, like artists are selling or the galleries are selling stuff from Instagram, but these are mostly, uh, you know, paintings or objects uh, and uh, not really like reels or 
even TikToks or like um, short videos. Uh, but uh, like, like you mentioned, this uh, lockdown uh, and COVID uh, uh, period was very uh, uh, demanding and changed a lot in the art world too, because uh, uh, out of a sudden many art fairs and uh, initiatives and also art academies started to use these tools uh, uh, for good. So uh, uh, it's like an ongoing process of development of this uh, sort of uh, layer or like a visual layer to what is happening in like the uh, real uh, venues and spaces and art spaces. So uh, uh, we, have, um, uh, we have a very uh, interesting um, selection of the panelists today. And like to give you um, uh, the background, because there was a discussion like two hours ago and we discussed like the VHS um, uh, uh, video cassettes as an art object, right? So this is like a, a bit uh, like a fast forward to what uh, is happening to, uh, you know, video art and collecting this sort of stuff. Um, um, and how the artists are using this. One of the panelists said that already venues uh, like uh, uh, Central Pompidou uh, uh, already started to buy or to acquire um, VRs, uh, videos from like Instagram and, uh, and other social media channels. And, um, and they also uh, are into like NFT, which is like you said, infamous, but it's still like, uh, it's still there. So it's, uh, also, um, I guess, an important context to, um, for us to discuss uh, uh, how these things may be used uh, or how they are used um, uh, in the art world uh, and in the art market. But, uh, uh, so we have like a, a very diverse, as I said, uh, um, selection of, uh, of guests. So uh, this is the meta person. Um, Fanny is a curator and uh, Carol is with us. Carol is a, is a is a video artist, but he's also a painter, and he just won the m uh, main prize uh, of Warsaw Gallery Weekend. And Fanny was also a um, um, jury member. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, Fanny, you will tell us about two things, like to to start with. One is um, how was it with this jury and everything, and the uh, the second thing would be. Uh, since you are curating this video program for the Warsaw Gallery Weekend, w what is all about, right? Because uh, not all of us um, uh, went to this um, Amondo and uh, to see the, the movie, so maybe a kind of like an introduction to your uh, curating here in Warsaw. Is it on? Yes, okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Adam. Um, yeah, I'm, thank you also for your presentation. I'm a bit surprised. I didn't expect uh, to hear so much about uh, the metaverse and, you know, so yeah, I think we're indeed like a very di diverse uh, group of, of people discussing here today. Um, I myself had the pleasure, yes, to spend the last two days um, in Warsaw and to be part of the jury, so which means that I basically within the last 48 hours visited almost all exhibitions of the galleries um, together with the jury and I thought it was very striking, I mean striking but uh, not necessarily surprising to see like how incredible, like the incredible large amount of painting that was of course presented um, in the gallery. So there was, um, I mean which is of course has obvious reasons because it is of course like the, the genre or medium that is, of course, let's say the most easy to, to sell for like especially private collectors, I would say. But um, considering the fact also how much, how little um, video works we saw within this past 48 hours, I think it is a really a great initiative and idea to invite someone to curate a film program and to pres present this in like an extra venue um, in a small cinema. Um, yeah, so um, thanks also for the invitation to do that. Um, I myself also I didn't manage to go to the cinema yet, I have to say, because I was on the run all the time. But um, yeah, maybe I can say a few words um, first about like how this program came together. So the idea, um, or this program takes place um, in the context of the so-called Eastern European platform that was initiated by the Warsaw Gallery Weekend, I, th uh, th I think two years ago, three years ago, three, <laughs> sorry. Um, and the idea, I mean, Joanna and I, we discussed like how this selection of works could come together because of course we're like here 
moving in the you know in the context of the Warsaw Gallery weekend. Um, but it is of course also interesting to kind of have moments where you can leave like also the context of Poland and kind of look beyond that. So we decided to work with an open call process in which the galleries could like send, the participating galleries could like propose and send in video works and portfolios from which I would then select and then kind of expand the selection through, you know, video works and moving image works that I kind of felt make sense in the selection to kind of look at, okay, what is missing for me? And the criteria was basically that this is kind of within the larger topic of Central Eastern European platform. So maybe this is a, as a short introduction of how this process took place. And um, I received a large amount of um, really great video works by the participating galleries, a lot of portfolios. It <laughs> took a large amount of time to view all of it. And... Um, you know, I mean, with with moving image, uh, or with, with with working with open calls, it's always this thing that you you can't really say like, oh, I'm going to work around the topic X, Y, Z, because you kind of have to see what kind of proposals reach you and what you build out of it. Um, and yeah, so I would say that basically the selection is a. You know, I I didn't really follow, or I decided to kind of make a more intuitive selection let's say and to not focus really on like one topic because it also f would feel like very constructed in a way you know if you kind of like f try to force it too much so um i think what, what what was kind of the interesting question in the in the beginning was this question of central eastern european platform because the first question is of course what is Central Eastern Europe? I myself, I come from Vienna, which if you look on the map of Europe is far more east than quite a few like countries and cities that we would consider Central Eastern Europe. But of course, um, you know, we may probably don't look, look at this uh, geographically, but maybe more like po politically, historically, and, um, and of course like this, but you know, this question of like what constitutes Central Eastern Europe um, is, you know, of course, uh, in, you know, it's usually, usually based on, of course, um, a joint or like common um, socialist past of, of these countries. But it is just such a gigantic re region, which is not actually a region, I would argue, but, um, you know, that includes so many con diverse countries that also somehow have, you know, not so much to do with each other as one would, would assume, that I also kind of decided to maybe also circumnavigate that question and to really just, you know, focus on the, you know, yeah, the selection of works and try to, within the selection, create a kind of narration, which is also not, maybe narration is a too big of a word. It is more like, let's say, a flow that the works um, follow based on, like, um, let's say the environments that we see in the program. So you kind of start in a more private sphere, we're in apartments, hotels, uh, Geta Prateshko studio, we move to the, the streets of Warsaw, we move to the cityscapes of Georgia, in Georgia, and end in, in Europe, you know, with this kind of question of Europe. So yeah, maybe this is a f first introduction to like the, the program, or yeah. <laughs> And uh, from, from what I understand, you uh, first you got to know those artists from Warsaw Gallery Weekend, uh, seeing those videos that were selected and sent to you by the galleries, right? And then, as a member of the jury, you were like uh, walking around and seeing these works of artists, uh, like uh, like paintings and objects in the galleries. So, what would be the relation, or how would you, um, you know, uh, talk about these two? kind of um, uh, images or like impressions about what those guys, what those artists are doing and how you as a curator um, work with this kind of art and uh, uh, what is important about the videos or what is the, the difference between this, those videos and for example paintings and objects that you see in a gallery. I mean, the process was, I mean, it was two very different processes. The one was of course curating a film program, the other one was kind of visiting um, all the galleries and meet the artists and gallerists. Um, some of the works, and I mean, I have to say that for me, it's also, I know that we are like, of course, being in the part of the Warsaw Gallery weekend is of course kind of an, 
endeavor, let's say, that is also focused on like, a, you know, more commercial per perspectives or of course, um, you know, galleries and artists um, hope to sell, collectors are coming and so on. But of course, I'm not, I'm not invited like um, either from the perspective of gallerists or, you know, artists. I, I was invited as a curator. So my perspective of like moving through the gallery weekend and also curating this film program was of course a very different one. So for instance, um, as I said, I mean, I think it is important to include like moving image works um, in like this extra venue to give the opportunity to also present this. But it is at the same time, as I said, I was a bit surprised that there's like really almost no video or m any moving image, any like ephemeral works in the actual gallery spaces. So, but this, yeah, I'm sure you discussed this. All. You were not part of the discussion earlier, right? The, or you? But then, uh, so, because this is like kind of cliche, right? That there is the art market and uh, the collectors who are buying paintings or objects, basically. And there are curators who are like looking for uh, video works or something that is less material, so to speak, that you can put on a show, uh, which is not so commercial in a way. So uh, uh, I also added like non-sellable works. I, you know, I also got like loans from like collections, museums, like not many, but I also like included historical works and that uh, were not like tied to a gallery. So I thought that this is also kind of, but again, like this is, I was not on a mission to like <laughs> um, necessarily create a film program that is, um, you know, made for like a collecting audience um, necessarily. But I think, yeah, this question of who is the audience of a program like this is of course also like an interesting one. Uh, but would you um, um, like, because you were talking about this uh, moving image, right? Which is a bit broader category than uh, uh, video as such. Um, uh, would you also like uh, uh, exhibit this kind of stuff that we've seen like a moment ago, like, you know, these VRs or uh, TikToks or whatever kind of art it is? I mean, I personally wouldn't, but just because I'm not a person that is like much, um, I don't want to say interested, but like virtual reality is not, I would not consider this like one of my, the fields of expertise, let's say. <laughs> um, but you know, no not yet, <laughs> maybe not yet. Um, so I was, but you know, within the film program, I actually went the other direction because I thought it is actually interesting to not only include, you know, contemporary or recent video art, but to really also look, you know, at documentary films, films, experimental film, video art, you know, uh, one work is actually a, more of a sound piece. So I was, you know, maybe also thinking about like a broader dimension of not necessarily moving image, but, you know, ephemeral art in general, let's say, yeah. Okay, Carol, it's your turn now, okay. So, um, uh, Carol is a prolific artist, so um, uh, he's a performer, a painter, a video artist, but also a filmmaker. Uh, he's working like an art historian with archives and uh, writing text, editing magazines. So, uh, how do you like maneuver around all those genres or like uh, medias and uh, what kind of, um, uh, how do you understand these categories that we discussed, like, you know, VRs, video, and uh, uh, moving image film? Um, maybe let's start with this. I think it's a uh, few things at the same time, because the medium is the one thing, and I never, that's why I use so many medias. I always study there, just behind this wall, in the painting department of Academy of Fine Arts, super traditional. And when I have the uh, meetings with students, I'm telling them to picture that, that I'm, it's 1999, I'm sitting in a room literally three meters from there, and we are learning how to press, how to get to the computer and slowly to the Photoshop. And we learn whole year to make three graphics on Photoshop, because we are painters and half of us don't have an email address. So from that, moment uh, to being here, it's a uh, different mindset and these discussions about the film and painting is not that relevant for me and I don't even see that much difference if it's commercial or not, it's just really what is it all about and what is the interest of the artist and sometimes I literally finding uh, some stories or doing the research 
And I still don't know if it will be a film or the series of paintings. So I got the prize on this uh, Warsaw Gallery uh, weekend event for paintings, but they are very discursive and it could be a, f a movie if I would have more money and time. It would be just a different decision. So this is the other one aspect. The other aspect is how the virtual reality or social media could be used to promote, to sell, or to uh, be used as a form of art. And there are totally different things for me. I use heavily Instagram, but mostly for the promotion, because uh, the Instagram, Facebook have so many limitations that actually they are um, one of the biggest enemy for the artist freedom. And I even see from the younger generation how they censorship themselves to fit to the Instagram. Because I have several shadow bands for my project, so I have to think about what I could share. And it's never fully my work or my expression. So it's a strategy how to use it as a marketing tool, which is something different than what we discuss. And on the top of that, many of my films, moving images, are so based on the archives and history that I deal mostly with the very analog uh, technique and uh, formats. So again, this more advanced technology, it's more interesting for me as a question how this could be shared, how it could be a new space for exhibiting in the online world. Yeah, this is very important what you said about this censorship because uh, uh, Carol, just to let you know, he's an uh, avid user of, um, of Instagram and he was posting as an uh, artist who uh, introduced the category of queer uh, in a way to Polish art. Also, um, um, lots of images with some kind of nudity, right? This was the reason why you uh, got censored several yeah, times. Yeah, but not only, like a shadow bounce for everything. You have to think always twice if you put anything or any content. Uh. <laughs> okay, but um, uh, like getting back to the videos and the um, uh, art market, uh, uh, did you sell some videos like in the past or uh, not, on only paintings? It's again an uh, interesting uh, question regarding the Polish context because when I was a student and uh, I thought, I, w I actually I spoke with my friends yes, last night about it, that when we were students at our times we thought that we're not going to do any money on art, so we were just exploring, doing things. But then uh, suddenly when I got some recognition, all the first works that were bought by the institutions were videos because the Center for Contemporary Art, uh, National Gallery, they all started to build a program starting from the 90s through the early 2000s based on the moving images. So for institution it was quite weird to buy the painting from the young artists. It was always like a video. So, so, so yeah, many of my early works were sold as a, uh, vi short videos or short films. Then it became more complicated because I started to do... Oh, it's another question, what is video art, what is film, and I don't want to start this discussion. But basically I started to do more regular narrative vid uh, film forms, and it became uh, tricky with the system of uh, visual art and the uh, art world here, how to sell it, how to distribute it. For example, when you work on a, a bit bigger production, because it's still very small budget, uh, you work on a film from the budget for the exhibition that uh, it could be a few paintings, it could be something, so you use this money to make a film. And then it's very limited budget, you do the film, and then the system kind of forces you to have only three or five copies, so two museums could buy it and one collector, and that's it. And then if you put it online, or you can't put it, or if this museum put it online, then it's breaking your way through the festivals, or for the other distribution, or even getting money for some created screenings online, because it's already exposed. It's quite problematic. And then you also can't actually get money from distributing this film in any other way, like on the DVDs, or like a independent films, for example. And he, this is a interesting for me moment, especially now when I'm doing more and more this kind of forms, that they are, they are completely not fit to the art world and the visual art market. So this is why you go to this documentary film festivals, or film festivals basically, right? Not uh, like the art kind of video things, or like collections. 
Yeah, definitely. Because when you work on the narrative form, even if it's 15 minutes film, like the one that Fanny is showing in, from my work in the program, then to force audience to start to watch it from the beginning to the end, we, we make these experiments. Like we, I have quite big solo show where one of the rooms were turned into the cinema just with the hours of the screening so people could feel like they are in the cinema and they will watch the film from the beginning. But it was very artificial, very hard. So I much more prefer festivals where people really want to focus. They, you see it on the big screen and a very good quality and you are actually watching from the beginning to the end and then you can talk and then the other festival can invite you and then some parts of this distribution can even get you money. So, so it's like a process because I remember when you were granted this awards by Samsung, right, as a video artist, I guess. But then you uh, reinvented yourself uh, as a painter in a way. So um, the question is if uh, you did this to sell or how it is, you know, uh, with painting uh, and your painting. No, as I said, I'm a painter. The only professional uh, prof profession that I can say. I'm an amateur filmmaker, amateur performer, amateur f photographer, amateur editor, amateur journalist, amateur historian. Uh, so uh, I, I quit painting because uh, not because it was commercial. There was not this discussion. As I said, it was even better to do videos for the uh, competition for young artists, for the institutions. That was actually uh, much better. But um, I based on the stories on, on the research of Central Eastern Europe queer past, and those stories need to be told in a special way. So if I would be in, one, in some point, the documentaries were not enough, so the, the second step would be go Spielberg way, building big set and reinventing the past in a uh, passionate way, or to make a paintings uh, that uh, express the figures, the events that we know only from the stories, but we never saw them. They are not even on the pictures, they are not on the uh, moving images. And that's how I actually I started from the portraits of the important queer figures from the past. And then just the aspect that I started to sell the works quite well just two years ago, I would say, it helps to me do, to do my very independent things, especially queer stuff in contemporary Poland, when we know the censorship is heavy and uh, it's hard to get any grant for anything which is feminist or queer. So uh, it's quite easy for me. I could put my private money from paintings for the vi film productions. Yeah, that's super important. Uh, since you have uh, Adam here, who's representing uh, Meta, so what would you expect from them? Or like, what would you like them to do? Or how to work with artists, uh, uh, a part of not censoring your work uh, online, right? It's a difficult question. It was interesting for me to see the presentation because it's also giving me some thoughts how uh, people who are work with technologies imagine the artworks. For example, with graffiti writers, I would imagine that the real graffiti writers would be more interested to work with porn or photography or other aspects by using this than doing 3D ways of the work. Maybe I'm wrong, but it just... Uh, what I wanted to say, the artists always need some time and then use it, the tools against the tools somehow. So it's not possible to predict and that's why it's it can be predicted from the beginning the way we're gonna talk, how it's gonna look. The pattern that I see constantly, it's the re uh, virtual reality and uh, cyber life and so on, imitate the real life. So usually they are building 3D spaces of white cube gallery, which is the most stupid thing you can do in the virtual reality. I think the these tools are need, be, need to be used more in an experimental way on many levels not imitating how beauty you are and how nice white walls you could have, not like in reality, but like perfect white walls, it's just absurd. Or doing the virtual shows of paintings, I just don't think it's, it's, it's useless. So, but in the same time, I feel old regarding the technology because I know that I will be not so conscious of the... Um, I'm not a programmer, I don't, I, whether I think it would be ambitious for the artist in using this, I cannot, it's just too hard for me. So I kind of decided to go even other way, uh, using my gesture and painting as something very mm, physical, analog, uh, not as a boycott or something against it, just like I feel I'd be more precise, more uh, unique than 
uh, going in the competition with the younger generation that it's uh, growing with the technologies and they are using them much uh, in a much more natural way than the artists that have to decide now. Mm -hmm. Adam, you want to comment on it? And uh... Uh, yes, um, I, I totally agree. I think that um, you know all these things that I'm showing uh, are the things that can be shown. Uh, um, that have been created without artists being involved, without uh, the, the imagination and the experimentation that is required to actually push this forward. Um, that said, I think that it is quite interesting to consider what, how art will be able to develop when certain constraints are lifted, right? Where architecture and the price of you know, certain materials and uh, the, you know, when the performance is liberated from the, the limitations of budget and gravity uh, and all those things. Um, regard, regarding uh, censorship, that is a, 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 a real pain and it comes from a variety of sources. Obviously, well, this is, you know, these platforms um, are by law available, accessible to people 13 and older. Uh, this is something that has to be uh, taken into consideration. Um, this is an American company and obviously uh, Europeans are a bit less prudish uh, than Americans are, for instance. Uh, so that this, of course, leads to a variety of, uh, of funny, if not grotesque problems, like the fact that, for instance, um, you know, museums posting images of Greek statues uh, are getting their um, accounts banned, and that leads to, uh, well, yeah, grotesque problems. Um, but ultimately, what we need to understand about these platforms is that they are, in a sense, public, as public space. And just like you can't do certain things out on the street, you can't do them uh, on these social media platforms. Unless, of course, you can find a way to, um, to create a community that is closed and where you can basically do things um, where the audience is, is, is controlled. Secondly, I think that when, when you do get a, 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 a... You do understand how this works then you can build a fantastic community uh, of people that are enthusiastic about your art. You can tell better stories about what it stands for, how it's created, and where it can be seen in reality. And in that sense, um, it's, it's, it is a very valuable tool to artists. And I think that, um, I, don't, I don't want anyone to think that, it's, it's, that art needs to kind of do TikToks. No, I, it's, it, it should go the other way around. <laughs> you know, I think that it, these, the, these short or even long form video uh, formats can exist and find an audience here. Uh, possibly that, that is important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Some comments or? Um, uh, I promise you to have it like um, uh, no longer than one hour, so we're almost there. Uh, uh, Questions, comments from the, from the audience, somebody? Uh, creator, artist, meta. Uh, one and only opportunity for you to ask a question or a comment. Hey, there is this TikToker. That, uh, you know, we have TikTokers in the art world, and it turns out that they are directors of the venues, uh, very important ones. So, uh, but it's not meta, of course. Um, uh, yeah. Um, you, you said that we would have the option to be part of the metaverse. Now we see that a, a version of it is social media. We are in it all the time. We're almost forced also to be there if you want exposure. To what extent do you think it's still optional then when the metaverse is here? Of course. I mean, we still have our free will. And, I mean, we, we use media as a tool um, 
And uh, no, nobody's forcing us to do that. Um, I think that uh, it's just a question of utility, the value that you get from it, um, both as a creator or um, a, a, pardon the word, consumer of content. So in a scenario in the future, if you, if you walk around and you'd be shopping or you're looking at galleries and all of a sudden everything AR is going to be intertwined with our, our reality, if you're not part of that metaverse, um, to what extent do we then still have the freedom to participate in actual life? It's really going to create a division between people that like the analog world and the others who are almost like forced, even if you're like a Gen Z or, or younger, uh, to be part of this virtual reality that augments the real reality. I think that people will have a choice to do that, just like they can decide to move out of the city and you know, live in Bierstadt. You know, yeah. I, you know, this is the sort of choices we need to make. And I think that it's really important to understand what you're gaining, what you're losing with it. And, uh, and you know, just make that equation. Do you think this is a, a, a good future? Well, I, 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 you know, do I think that it's a, yes. the virtual reality future? Um, the future in which we have a choice about what we want to do, where we want to work, how we want to make our money. I think, you know, I think that this is a, a better future where you have greater options. Because today, you can, for instance, work in Warsaw and live in Warsaw. In the future, you will be able to live in Warsaw and work in Sydney, and that might actually be good. Yeah, good point, thanks. Um, I mean, this is really complicated, and I'm very grateful for all those questions, and I'm very happy to have you here, because I guess now you know that meta is not so obvious in the mm -hmm. art world, right? And that this is very complicated when it, when it comes to these relations and the feelings towards social media and Facebook and Instagram uh, specifically. We make these social media, right? I mean, we're all responsible for what what's happening in that media. And I think that it's really critical to also understand the role of a variety of institutions that need to make people aware how to make use of, the of tools that are available to us. And just like in the 70s, we, was, you know, we were told, don't watch too much TV, right? And go out and play ball and, you know, I think that this is, I mean, I represent a company, right? It's in the market to make money out of advertising, okay? But there are other players that regulate what is right, right? So we have governments, we have schools, we have all types of authorities that need to participate in a conversation about what sort of society will we want to live in? The thing is that um, I guess uh, I don't know how it would be uh, with Warsaw Gallery Weekend without Instagram and um, uh, Facebook. So, uh, and I guess also like uh, the um, uh, the art market nowadays almost cannot function without these tools. So, uh, uh, and uh, it's also telling how artists and creators are adapting to this. Uh, uh, reality or virtual reality. The, uh, w w from my perspective, what is interesting is that they are somehow like conservative and, um, uh, when it comes to using those tools. Because, like we discussed, this neo avant-garde artists of the 60s and 70s, when they were in the avant-garde of um, uh, of new media development. Uh, right now, you can have this impression that um, uh, artists try to uh, resist or uh, slow down this process of. Uh, like uh, uh, being part of this uh, uh, change. Um, but this is my impression, and uh, uh, just to also let you know how it looks like um, uh, from this, let's say, our perspective of Warsaw Gallery Weekend and the art world in general. Uh, okay, some more questions and comments? But not about like uh, if, if it's gonna be a good, uh, like a future, bright future with or without Facebook, because uh, we don't really know. and. Uh, but maybe some, uh, somebody uh, wants to ask a question about creating video art or like uh, how it is to win a prize and um, or so that we can't. Oh, you again, no, 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 first. 
Valdek, and then you, okay? So uh, you wouldn't be this one guy who will be asking all questions uh, in the room. Uh, this is the TikTok guy. This is the guy who introduced the artwork in Poland to TikTok. I'm not TikTok. Uh, I only <laughs> was the gallery video, video maker of video TikToks <laughs> for other artists. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, to Adam. Uh, you mentioned that uh, this material uh, which is shown show, showed to us uh, was. Pre produced without artists and uh, for me it is very interesting uh, why company such a company like Meta don't uh, invite artists to work on uh, this metaverse because uh, for me uh, such a platforms are uh, uh, can be very fruitful and uh, for artists and uh, it is not only as a tool for artists, but also um, way of thinking uh, of artists can be good, uh, how to say, way to open uh, your perspectives in uh, creating this. So I, I absolutely agree. I, what I said is that the materials that I've shown were basically crafted to um, appeal to basically marketing audiences, right? And it's basically a, uh, just a, a, a visualization that is supposed to be pretty, uh, but not necessarily um, have artistic uh, appeal, right? Um, but that said, I think that the, the critical thing about this technology and its future um, is what sort of solutions will be made available to people wanting to create these virtual or video or uh, image, um, you know, expressions, um, and what how how easy will that will it be for them to actually, you know, create? Because obviously. If, if, you're, if you have to you know, do 10 years of IT schooling to actually develop it, then it's useless. But for instance, combine this with artificial intelligence and you get um, a tools where you actually just provide very simple sketches, add some verbal instruction to it, and the AI actually sculpts the, the, the virtual world for you, with you. And that actually, I think, is, is quite interesting. I think, you know, be, before the robots take the world over, I think that uh, they'll be quite useful also for artists. Uh, uh, plus, there were some um, uh, examples of this kind of cooperation. Like with John Rafman, they did this... Uh, uh, together some of the projects with, uh, with, with Facebook, not Meta, it was like uh, around 10 years ago, and with curators like Lev Manovich was also working for uh, Facebook, producing his like Instagram exhibitions and like uh, research, uh, conducting research with like uh, big data and stuff like this. So uh, there were some examples, I guess they are not in Poland and they are not that well uh, known, but uh, I guess they have some like artists uh, in, the, in the team or like working for Meta. Okay, the, there is uh, uh, you first and then you, yeah, okay. Um, so I have a question to Carl. Uh, in terms of like being an artist, obviously uh, creating multimedia AI, um, AR, uh, usually you get hired, right? For someone it's uh, expensive technology, but what about uh, NFTs? Have you been ever involved in uh, an NFT project or do you consider it um, a good resolution for independent artists? I never tried and I'm not criticizing. It's just never any 
good proposition come out, what I was seeing it was connected with a specific aesthetic and uh, it's kind of a way to make money. You know, we are really on the level, if I'm doing silk print in the 100 uh, copies edition, collectors crying that it's too much. So thinking about the other way of making money, if NFTs is just like impossible on some levels. And uh, so I'm just not getting to discussion somehow. What I just wanted to say, it's not exactly relating to your question, but more like a remark. Artists versus the social media and so on. It's really, as I said, I heavily, heavily use Instagram Reels and so on. It's just really a tool for promotion and we have to address that because the limitation, it's not only, oh, if I can show the explicit images or dig or so on. It's just like how the algorithm creates what it's getting to the audience. If you, it's even too much text, it will be hide it. Or if it's now the reels are so promoted that the uh, images that are not moving, they are not really appearing on the feed. So I kind of go that way. For me, it's interesting to experiment, but I see for some people, they just have to force themselves to do something completely different just to promote. And um, that's pretty tricky that you are fighting the system that is based on algorithms and commercial values. Uh, and the, the, there is no much fun for artists to do experiments because the audience is starting to be limited, so then they prefer to experiment in the real life when they get the feedback from five people who really are into that. I have friends, they have three, 300, 200 followers and they're doing very experimental stuff, but nobody knows because they're not even getting to these 300 people who are following them. So when I want to promote the show, I always put the Beyonce song and then immediately 10,000 in one hour and then they see just the painting that I'm filming like that. But it's not experiment, it's just like my conscious way of using this equipment. And it's the same with NFTs. If I will reach to the point that it would be good money, I would never say no. Yeah, sure. It just never get to me as an interesting proposal. So for me, it's not ideological issue or so ever. It just really if it works or not. The more problematic moment is when you, the, there is a sensor of nipples, of men, women, how, you know, uh, relating to the gender, the issues that are interested, for, interesting for me that art want to kind of um, challenging. And then it's really about not the law, but how pe people who are designing think what could be possible. The same with hair, that pubic hair that have to be shaved, then it's okay. If a bit of pubic hair, then I have the ban for three days. And it just uh, really, for some artists, I understand. I like to play with that, but some artists don't. They don't have time to just fight the system uh, to be to have some more likes or artificial followers that they will not be engaged fully with that. Thanks for the talk. Um, as a person who's trying to use social media as little as possible, quite frankly, I found your presentation terrifying. But um, the, in thinking about ramifications and consequences of that, I wanted to ask Fanny and Carol, um, so far, how do you think if, um, and if so, how uh, did social media affect your practice in general and your work with moving image in particular? In particular, yeah, but also in curatorial practice. Hmm, interesting question. I think, I mean, I'm also rather one of the people that I, I do have a Facebook account, I do have an Instagram account, but I use it really quite, um, I don't know, for, for me it's really something that I use and I rather use as like a tool of observation, of researching, because you kind of, and I agree, I, I don't think at this point is it's that optional anymore to to you know whether you can you know be yeah i mean of course uh, you know we we can have choices but if you want to be kind of up to date and you want to follow like certain developments and so on i think there's hardly a way around um social media or um yeah um in terms of curating, I think, so I, I'm a person who's not like engaging so much with that, so I think that for me it did not have such an impact. I mean, it is, it is um, definitely a tool that kind of 
um, makes it easier to kind of, yeah, follow developments, to reach out to people, and you can really like, you know, I follow so many like spaces, galleries and so on, so I, it really helps me to keep up to date with um, recent shows of artists, with, you know, institutions or places that I, whose program I, I find interesting to kind of follow up on that. Um, in terms of moving image, I don't really see how it actually affects my work, um, but yeah, in, yeah. I can say that it's not like hardly influenced my artwork, but uh, influenced a lot the way I communicate with my audience, I would say, because uh, I had several situations, even, even to get more serious things with the attacks from the public TV or some politicians, I used uh, Instagram as my private newspaper, my private channel, because of the number of followers and uh, the way that I could uh, uh, immediately talk to the people recording, uh, communicating, commenting or translate or explaining them what happened in, on my uh, turn and having even bigger uh, visibility than the other media, it helps a lot, it become a regular tool and it influences much the way how I communicate as an artist. Sometimes I have the analog show, but the people are willing to write the comment or private message instead of approaching me on the opening. So it's become a really big change from what I remember when I was a student or just a super young artist at that time. And, uh, but it's consuming so much time that uh, I have to every day think how much time I devote to my real work and how much time I devote to the promotion and communication because it's addiction and somehow you can't easily say, okay, just two hours and 20 minutes. It's just not working that way. You're constantly working because of that. And that's a very tricky part. And this is, I realized this influence the way I exist as a creator very much. But I believe that what he's doing on Instagram is an artwork, you know, uh, and it may be one day like purchased by a, a, a museum or a collector. I was actually um, uh, telling some of the collectors to start to buy Instagram feeds and, um, and Facebook of artists, but it didn't really happen, at least in Poland. But some of these things are really outstanding, and this is why I was um, um, uh, like pointing at uh, Waldek Tatarczuk because I also think that when he was like inviting artists to to make some TikToks and he was using this kind of tools, it was it was really like something like um, um, uh, like being in avant-garde in a way, like experimenting, having fun, but also like uh, putting things uh, somehow a bit farther with. Uh, um, with what you can do or how you can think about, uh, you know, word and social media and stuff like this. So it was not only for promotion, but also I think in this context of art, it was very, very important. However, I'm not sure if this is um, uh, for sale. Uh, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is this is how it happens. So it's also very, very influential what um, uh, what Carol is doing, and also uh, to venues curators, but also to, uh, uh, to artists. So um, uh, this is why he's uh, winning those prizes, uh, guys. So um, um, yeah, I think uh, we'll uh, end this panel discussion right now and uh, we'll go to uh, Amondo to see the uh, movies that you've selected and you haven't seen yourself and to see the uh, Marvel's exhibition uh, uh, of Carol. Um, so uh, thank you very much for uh, being here with us and uh, answering all those, you know, questions. I'm, I'm so grateful, really, uh, because I knew that it may be going into this direction. So thank you, Adam, thank you, Carol, and thank you, Fanny, and thank you all for coming here and being here with us. And thank you, Anna and Bożena, for inviting me. Mm -hmm.